but we want to start a six-week um, series on the book of James practical and we wrote a little study guide on that divine guidance for practical living because the book of James is very practical and you know we're in case you haven't figured out Clarence and I are very practical ministers we we want to have the Word of God in come into your life and help you with your everyday life just as much as yes we believe in the supernatural we believe in the gifts of the spirit but we also believe that when you walk out of here you've got a life to live amen, amen? and you need tools yes. so the book of James is one of the what is a very practical book and so the book came about in a very odd way we got married in 2014 and most of you know, and I don't want to rehash everything, 2013, I had the worst summer of my life. I went into a depression. Nobody knew about it. I just, I went from home to work. If I had to shop, I did that, and then I went home. This is what I did all summer long. I didn't want to do nothing. And if you know anything about Massachusetts, summer is when you get the good weather. So if you were gonna go out and do something, you're gonna do it out in the summer. And I just, I wasn't interested in anything. I was in a pretty bad depression. I thought I just bought my house and I thought, well, I'm stuck in Pittsfield for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I had a, somewhat of a bad attitude and I was depressed. You know, I thought, well, you know, I'm never gonna be a man here. I'm gonna always be doing this. And it, sometimes we get in that place, in that position where we think this is gonna be the rest of our life. But I'm here to tell you, you're just going through it. And the first one is faith's trials. So as you know, a year later, I married Clarence and I always ministered that, you know, if I could have looked ahead a year, I wouldn't have been so depressed and it would have helped me. So, you know, if we could look ahead a year, sometimes we wouldn't be so depressed because we're sometimes caught up in the moment. But that depression came back. Now we, in 2014, we got married, it was exciting. You know, we did some traveling in 2015. 2016, we moved to Texas. So it was like all this excitement. And then in February 2017, I hit a wall again. Because you can't live at that level. Eventually you just hit a wall and it's like, I, you know, we were ministering the way we had thought we were when we were down here. Things weren't happening the way we thought we were down here. I had a lot of time. I didn't have friends down here in Montgomery. I mean, I, I knew people, but I, all my friends were back in Massachusetts, so it wasn't like you go out to lunch or, thank God Clarence and I had a great relationship because he was the only one that I saw days on end because we didn't, I didn't have a job to go to or anything. And, and I had a wall in 2017. And while I was sitting there, and I wanna tell you that you guys who sing, you sure sound good all together. You harmonize, it, it just, what's going on here just makes my heart feel so good. And I was sitting there tonight and the Lord just reminded me of 2013 when I went into that depression, and then he said, and now the next step was facing it again in 2017, because everything had stopped being exciting. We weren't ministering. Things were kind of, we had a lot of pressure on us, and I just didn't have a direction. Now here's a person, I have direction every day of my life. You know, if it's one thing or another, I, it's like, oh, okay, and if I don't have direction, I go and make my own direction, and I go find something. And here, I didn't have any direction. I didn't have anything to do, and I smacked at a wall with, I don't know what to do with myself. And it was a very bad place to be for myself because I just didn't know what to do during the day. You know, I'm not the church secretary anywhere. We didn't really have a church home that we could go and do things. I wasn't really close enough to anybody that I could pick up the phone. I mean, I tried to establish things, but in the meantime, 
God was weaving things in the background. And see, you all were up here in Aubrey, and, and God was weaving things up here and causing turmoil and upset up here. We were down there, and we were dealing with our thing. And God was weaving things and putting things together in a very odd way, which we wouldn't have known back in February of 2017. Who would know that anything would have happened the way it happened? Amen? So I was there, and... The Lord said, well, you're going to have to do something. You know, I felt like God was saying, you have to do something. So I said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll take up knitting again. I used to love to knit 30 years ago. And so I was like churning out a scarf a night. I mean, it was, we'd get, we'd go by Walmart and Clarence would say, baby, you need yarn? <laughs> you know, I had him trained. I mean, it was, it was helping me because it was giving me a creative outlet. So I went from scarves to hats. I knitted a sweater. I knitted, a, I think I knitted a dog. So I don't remember everything I knitted. And I thought, oh, geez, I really like this. This is really a good activity. And I know y'all like those little rose things that you got for Mother's Day. It's a compulsion with me. You know, I just finished a baby blanket. And it was one thing that helped me through a time when I just didn't know what to do. And sometimes we get into a time where we just don't know what to do, and then we fall into a depression, so we stop doing everything. But this time around, I couldn't do that. First of all, he wouldn't let me do that anymore. I had an accountability partner. So number one, if you're going through something, get somebody who you can be accountable to. And that isn't going to let you wallow in your own stuff. So that was the first thing I did. The second thing I did was I looked outside of our townhouse. We had a beautiful pool. I started to swim as often as I could swim. That also became a compulsion for me. Now I can't swim. <laughs> See, so I would get in the pool and I, I can dog paddle. I can swim on my back. I just don't like to put my head under water. For me, it's scary and I couldn't do it if I had to do it. Like if I fell into the water, I think I could float up enough. I know how to tread water. But I just went in the water and I swam back and forth in my little doggy paddle and I went around and about 45 minutes and then I'd come in and I'd shower and get ready and then I'd knit. <laughs> and it got me through a time where I didn't know what to do with myself. And while I was going through, I don't know what to do with myself, the Lord said, get out some cassettes what we were doing for the ministry at the time was he had a lot of he has a he had like 300 cassettes i mean I, I could take you to our house and you would say wow i can't believe you still have cassettes we were taking the cassettes and putting them on cd and then i was editing them we were packaging up a series so i felt the holy spirit lead me to he did the book of james and I was listening to it, and I really felt prompted to start a study guide with that. So we co-authored it. I took his stuff, I read the book of James, I took notes, and then we put it together. So for the next six weeks, we're gonna be doing it, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna do all six weeks, or we're gonna take turns, or whatever. But um, that's how the book of James, a uh, divine guidance for practical living, came to being, was born out of total frustration with Lord. I mean, we would try to, we would visit churches and people would be welcoming and very kind, but we just didn't fit. Did you ever go to a church that was great, but you just didn't fit? You just didn't fit anywhere. And we just didn't feel like we fit anywhere. But, and there was God up in heaven and he was weaving and he was making a plan and he was doing something. So I'm telling you tonight, if you're going through something, think of God that he's up in heaven and he's weaving and he's putting people together. Hey, even Clarence, who was a, lived in Texas all of his life, he had hardly heard, you never heard of Aubrey, did you? No. Okay, so God was weaving and putting things together. And when you're going through things and you're going through a depression or you're going through something hard, just think of God that he's putting things together behind the scenes that you can't even see. 
and it'll help you to know that you're going through something, but there's another side. If you're going through it, there's a side to it. That's a, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and then there's an end to that trial. Somehow, some way, there's an end to it if you can hold on to it and put faith in God. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight about trials. Trials are unavoidable, they're inevitable, and they're good for you. All right, everybody goes through trials, saved, unsaved, black, white, yellow, green, old, young, everybody goes through trials. But it's the way you handle them that makes us stand out between the saved and the unsaved, the Christian and the non-Christian. The definition, oh, let me just read James 1, 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Okay, so the count it all joy part, I don't think we're all in for that. Amen. When you're going through something hard, you know, maybe you're different than me. My thing is when I'm going through something hard, I want my knitted blankie and I want to wrap myself up and I want to feel sorry for myself. All right, I'm not into the joy thing yet. You know, where you count it all joy. But you can see ahead of time how if you know that you're going through it and you can be mature enough, and I'm, I'm on the road to maturity, okay? I haven't gotten there yet. I still get frustrated when things don't go my way. Amen? Am I talking to anybody in here? My God, some of you people have been Christians longer than I have been born. And so you have been through things, and you know that when you go through them, counting it all joy is difficult to do. do does anybody? You know, when you're going through health things, you know, how many are going, yeah, I'm going through hell things and I'm going to be a winner in it. No, we kind of maybe have that initial reaction, is, but then, you know, the reality sets in and it hurts and, and you can't get out of bed because your joints are, or you can't do anything because your body won't react right. Or, you know, if you're going through something financial, it's like, well, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's the first of the month. We've got to pay this, 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 and this. Or if you're going through relational things with your kids or your husband, and it's not a joyful experience. But he says to count it all joy, so we have to do it spiritually. We have to do it within our spirit. We have to see something bigger. We have to know that God's up there and he's weaving things together for us so that maybe right now things don't look so good like it did in 2017 in February. Maybe right then things didn't look so good, but God was putting things together. You know, maybe in this church things didn't look so good a year ago, but God was putting things together. See, and maybe you're going through something right now where it doesn't look so good, but God's putting things together. That's why we can count it all joy, amen? Because if we have confidence and we have the maturity and we have the spiritual vision, we can see that God's putting something together for us. Amen? So the trial is a test of faith, patience, or stamina through subjection to suffering or temptation. Um, definition two is a source of vexation or annoyance or a trying or a tryout or experiment to test quality, value, or usefulness. So that's what the definition of a trial is. So it's it's a test. It's something that go that we either we have self-inflicted ourselves by disobedience. Sometimes our tests and trials are because of our own self-will and we've disobeyed, now we're in a mess. And sometimes it's a God thing, like with Job. You know, he was tested and tried, but he really didn't do anything. To, to, to get that, God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And it was like, no, well, oh, you know, he's got a little bit of his hedges down. But God had to point it out to him because God was going to show something and demonstrate to us everything in this Bible is for our good and for our future. So he said, I want to demonstrate something 
to Aubrey Faith Assembly. And so we're going to have to put Job through these trials. Amen? Amen. So everybody faces challenges. What's the end result of the trial between a saint and a sinner? What's the end result? And it's how we, it's our attitude. It's how we perceive things. You know, our response to trials, what is our response to trials if we get an answer from God that we don't like? You know, what if we prayed and, and our loved one dies? What if, um, you know, we, we have to file bankruptcy because there's no other choice? You know, what if our husband walks out on us? What if we pray and the answer isn't what we wanted? Did God still answer prayer? The keeping power of the Lord. He promised us, he said in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may show yourselves to be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on those who are evil and on those who are good, and makes the rains fall on the righteous, those who are morally upright, and the unrighteous, the unrepentant, those who oppose him. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers, wishing them God's blessing and peace, what more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles who do not know the Lord do that? You therefore will be perfect, growing into spiritual maturity, both in mind and character, actively integrating godly values into your daily life as your heavenly Father is perfect. All right, the key in that is in the last verse that says, so you shall grow in spiritual maturity. It's hard to love your enemies. It's hard to love that person at, at your job that's making you totally miserable, that you're saying, God, I need to get out of this job because I'm gonna hurt that person if they, if they continue on me. But God says to love your enemies. Think about this, when Stephen was being stoned, if you look at Acts 7, he was being stoned and he said, don't lay this sin to their charge. That prayer opened up the door for Saul of Tarsus to be saved. And he was one of the most vicious, vile Christian haters on the planet. But Stephen saw beyond who he was and he was able to say, God, don't lay this to, to their charge. Mm -hmm. They were pelting him with stones. And you think about what it must have been like for Stephen. They're pelting him with stones. He says that, he lays down, he goes to sleep. And the Lord takes him home because he said, I see the Lord. And that really drove evil men crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, then they started gnashing their teeth and, uh, and then they started picking up stones and stoned him. But he was so mature, he said, Lord, don't lay this to their charge. And then he just laid down and went to sleep in the midst of something very horrible. He just laid down and went to sleep. So you think about the trial that you're going through. You know, can we get to the point where we say, Lord, just don't lay it to their charge. Then lay down and go to sleep at night, but wake up the next morning with force. You know, how can we grasp the ultimate purpose of our trials and learn to count our troubles out all joy? Because we realize that these trials are gonna burn out the dross in our character. And I had to face myself going through that because I've historically had problems with depression. You know, I just have, it's just something that, you know, and you've all got areas where you deal with more than others. And that's one of the areas that I dealt with. And I have to believe that living with my husband, you can't hardly be depressed because he just, he's, he's very full of joy. And if you ever need, if you're ever depressed, just go and hang around him for a little bit and you'll feel better. But as we mature, we learn how to pray the perfect will of God and to walk every day in the joy of the Lord, not depending on natural circumstances to create a good day for us. He could be having the worst thing happening to him, you would never know it. You don't mind if I brag on him because he is, he is my husband. But um, 
you know, I've watched him go through stuff and it doesn't affect the way he treats others. He's very kind all the time. You would never know whether he's going through anything. And so it's good to rub shoulders with him because I, I'm learning something from him. I'm watching his walk with the Lord and I'm saying, wow, it is possible to live this life. It is possible to have victory over these things. But see, I had to go in 2017. I had to face that giant again. So don't think just because you faced something once that it's gonna be over with. There's gonna be like a retest. Just to like a, think of it as a refresher course. You know, we're gonna see how much you really learned on the first time. And if we know that our trials have a purpose to them, it makes it a whole lot easier. I mean, the people in the world go through bad stuff all the time and there's no rhyme or reason for it. It's like, you know, if you believe in karma or coincidence or, you know, then people just go through stuff and, and there's not any reason for it. We can go through stuff and have a purpose for it. We can say, all right, Lord, this is hard, but I know that what you're doing in me, you're burning out the dross, you're opening up my eyes, you're helping me to be a better person so that I can minister to somebody else. Even if you're not a minister, like a licensed minister, you're still touching people's life every day. Everybody in here touches somebody's life. And how you react to pressure, don't, don't you know that people who aren't saved are watching your life? They're watching to see what you do. They're watching to see what you're going to do. How big is your God? They're gonna watch you to see how big your God is. So if you go through and have a nasty attitude, even that's okay because you can turn around and tell somebody who's watching you, you know what, I'm having a bad attitude and I'm sorry, but God is still working on me. If we can get humble enough where we can say, I'm sorry, you know, that I've had a bad attitude over this. It's not a crime to have a bad attitude. It's a crime is when you try to hide it. Because we all have attitudes at times. We all have things at times. And that's not the crime. The crime is not having it. The crime is hiding it. And the crime is acting like you're perfect when you're not perfect. And that's when you're gonna lose your joy. But when you get it out in the open and you say, I'm dealing with this and I need help, you're 90% helped because you can get it out in the open. So he says, count it all joy. It's not easy to do, but we know that it's a purpose so we can count it as all joy. Even if you have to say in your soul, man, this is joy. Hello, we're going to count this all joy. And then your emotions are going to catch up with your spirit, man. See, because we're a three-part being, spirit, soul, body. Our spirit should be the leader, but often our emotions are the leader. But when our emotions lead us and we don't feel like it because we're depressed, we don't feel like it because we're this or we're that, then our emotions are leading the way. And what God does during these trials is he takes that and he tries to hone us down so that our spirit man can rise up above that and say, well, you know, even though I don't feel like going to work today, I'm going to get up and I'm going to take my shower and get dressed and I'm gonna to go to work and I'm gonna have a good attitude about it. And then you've won something in the spirit realm. Instead of saying, well, you know, I gotta to go to work and I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna shower and then get ready and I'm gonna make sure that they all know that I have a bad day. Now we don't ever say that, do we? But boy, sometimes we let people know that we're having a bad day. So James says, count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Here's why trouble works endurance. Works patience. We work out our personality flaws, we confront and conquer bad habits, and we increase our faith in God's plan. When we receive an answer to our prayer, we gain more confidence in God. You know, trials and troubles make you sometimes press in more to seek the Lord too. Have you ever had a desperate need and told the Lord about it and God sent somebody to help you? 
It's like, wow, you know? Such joyful time when prayer is answered. Not only for you, but for the person who answered it. It's like, wow, they heard from God, and they're excited, and you're excited. It confirms to both people that God is real. He's praying. He heard your prayer, and he touched the heart of someone else to be a blessing. Our trials and troubles can work patience in us if, if we understand that there is a God, and he's our Father who's personally involved with you. He's your Father. Tonight, if you're born again, he's your Father. He's not just your Creator, he's your Father. And he is personally involved with you. He sees your struggles. He sees what you're going through. All right, our trials can work patience in us if we understand that our God answers prayers. And he answers our prayers. You know, stop looking at other people and saying, oh, they're so lucky. They're so lucky. You don't know how lucky they are until you've walked in their shoes. You may find out you like your shoes a whole lot better. Okay, we, our trials and troubles can work patience in us if we understand that God is going to help us with his very best answer, even if we don't like the answer or understand the answer. We may not understand the answer. We may not like the answer. I didn't like it when I was crying to God and saying, you know, I'm so frustrated. And then he said, well, you know, get those cassettes out and, and listen to that on the book of James. And then it gave me direction and I felt a lot better. I don't like being untethered. I don't like, I'm not a free spirited person, okay? I need to have some kind of direction. I just don't wake up in the morning and go, well, what will be, will be. I like to have some kind of knowledge of what I'm gonna do that day. Makes me feel better, makes me happy. You know, we all, I think we all like some kind of a goal during the day, even if it's a small goal, it's still a goal. Our trials and troubles can work patience in us because our spiritual growth is dependent on our trials and tribulations. Your spiritual growth, the only way you're gonna grow is if you have a, an, a, a reason to use that spiritual muscle. Can you look back at, at, at a problem that you've had in your own life and that had you worried and upset at the time, now that time has passed, can you see more now when time has passed, sometimes we can look back and see, yeah, I can see God's hand was on that. That's what we're, we're looking back at 2017, which really was a bad year for us, and look back and say, yeah, we see God's hand. We see the hand of God. You know, over and over we saw the hand of God on us. I mean, it's just incredible. Maybe you're in a place of being stuck and overwhelmed with your negative cir circumstances. But tonight, I hope that you can get a refreshing to know that you're just going through it. It's not permanent. I don't care if you've been in it for what seems like forever. It's still not permanent. You're still going through it. You know, it's like the difference between going, you know, from, from here to Denton or from here to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. One journey is just slightly shorter. So we go through it, and it takes, sometimes it takes longer. But you can grow in your patience and know that God is working things out. He's up, he's up there, and he's working things out. He's interweaving things, because only God can take all billions of people that are on this earth and weave people together and put situations together. And that takes time. It takes time even for God to do things because then you've got people's wills involved and you've got circumstances and all these things involved and it takes time for things to work out sometimes. And, you know, I don't know exactly everything about that, but I do know that you can go through the profit, the process of your trial with confidence, knowing that God will help you and that it will work out in the end somehow some way and sometimes we go through these things and it's not for our benefit but it's to help somebody else 
And when you said that this morning, I said, boy, is she going to preach my sermon today or what? No, that's okay. That's okay. It was confirmation. But answered prayers can be like the little four-year-old boy who asks his mom for a cookie. Now, his mom loves him, right? But she says no because it's too close to supper time. She doesn't want him to spoil his appetite for his dinner. And sometimes God has to tell us no because the timing is wrong. So if you've asked for something and you can see it, that you know, in here, in the Bible, that it says, and God says not now, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It just means not now. It's too close to supper time. And that cookie is going to ruin your supper. Mm -hmm. And we might be like that little boy that doesn't like the answer and throws this big temper tantrum. And then we start getting mad at God. We start screaming at God. We don't want to wait till later. We want that cookie now. And we might try to bargain with God or try to guilt him. But just like that little boy's mother, God says no. And he knows what's best for us. And sometimes we leave him with no other choice because of our behavior than to discipline us. God's got to discipline us. Why? Because we said at the beginning, he's not just your creator, he's your father. What father in here isn't going to discipline their child if they're out of line? Why do you discipline your children? Because you're looking at past those 18 years that you have them in the house. And you're saying if they continue with this behavior, then that, that's going to be hard for them in the workplace. They throw a fit every time their boss says, no, you can't do that. So we have to snuff that behavior out when they want to cook and say no and teach them how to understand the word no. So God's a good father. We have to have confidence that God's going to release blessings in his perfect timing and not ours. He doesn't want to give us something we're not ready for, something that is going to harm us. You're not going to let that five-year-old kid sit in your car and drive your car down, or down to Denton. Why? Because they're not ready. It isn't that you're not going to buy them a vehicle when they're 16 or 17. It's just that when they're five, they're not ready. They're not mature enough. If they kick and scream and they want the car, I mean, that's ridiculous. You wouldn't do that. But sometimes we do God like that. We're kicking and screaming for something that we think we're ready for. And God's saying, you're not ready yet. You know, you're, you're a five-year-old trying to get into a car, and I'm telling you no. And then he has to discipline us. And then we set ourselves back, just like the children of Israel. You know, he, how many times he helped them out and get them food, water? First of all, he got them out of Egypt. And they weren't even excited about it after they got down the road and it started to be a little painful. And they started to complain. And then they were up against the Red Sea and then they started complaining. And then he fixed that problem for them. Then he gave them food and they started complaining. They wanted quail. They started complaining, 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 complaining. And sometimes our prayers to God sound like complaining, 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 complaining. And God's just up there, I'll wait. Why? Because he's weaving stuff. Even though we're complaining, even though we're not acting the way we should be, God is just waiting because he's weaving this stuff. And he knows you're going to have the victory eventually because it's going to work with maturity. At some point in your life, the light's going to go on. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have maturity. Amen? That's right. When we develop trust, we know that God will come through for us, even if it's at the very last minute. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on, on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. Trust in the Lord. Put confidence in God. And just remember what looks like victory to God may look different to us. Sometimes circumstances just don't go our way what we want. You know, the person dies, we get the divorce, the sickness, you know, all these things. Sometimes it doesn't look like victory. But think about this. The crucifixion was a spiritual victory, won for all of mankind, but it didn't look like a victory. Did it? No, the, the, the disciples scattered. It didn't look like victory to them. I mean, it's easy for us. We have the whole story. We could read. We can just keep reading and we see where the victory is. But think about it. Put yourself in their place. And they thought that Jesus was going to come and be king. And he was crucified. And it's like, uh, uh, 
that's not supposed to happen. How do we get it? Why is that? So see, sometimes naturally doesn't look like victory. In God's eyes, it's he's like, yeah. In our eyes, it's you know, we're we're weeping, we're hiding, we're doing all these things, and, and God's saying, No, there's the victory here. Open your eyes. You know, you think about when Elijah, Elijah was there, and they said that, you know, we're surrounded. And he said to a servant, open your eyes, and you can see there's more of that, there's more of us than there are of them. And God tonight is saying, open your eyes and see. Yeah. Open your eyes and see the victory. Amen? Amen? Your attitude determines the length and the outcome of your trials. A negative attitude will cause God to withdraw his Holy Spirit. He may even have to discipline you because you're having a spiritual tantrum. Don't complain or be angry because it's going to prolong your difficulty. God isn't going to let you get away with bad behavior and give you your own way because you demand it. God is not going to allow you to be a spoiled child. Now, we may spoil our children. God's not going to allow you to be a spoiled child. God is a perfect parent. You can't pull anything over God you know if you're there wrapped up in your newly knitted blanket depressed sucking your thumb and you don't want to talk to anybody you're not fooling God so your attitude and response determines your defeat or victory and it's all spiritual it's all in the spirit remember while we're sitting here God's weaving things he's putting things together he's bringing people in you can see this church full, amen, because it's happening. It's happening week by week, it's happening. Why? Because God's putting things in place. He's weaving things, he's putting things together. And your attitude towards life challenges can keep you as a spiritual baby or help you to grow victory by victory. I just turned 61, I'm the baby in my family. Right? My three sisters, in their eyes, I'm the baby. And if you're the baby in your family, you can relate to that. Amen? Do I have babies? Do I have any babies in here? Like your sisters and brothers, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're the baby, and you can only relate to this if you're the baby. If you're not the baby, then it goes over your head. But if you're the baby, you'll always be the baby. My mother, when she died, I was her baby. So you can be a spiritual baby all of your life. Just like I am the baby and I get to pull the baby card if it happens. Sometimes I pull the baby card with him. Sometimes he lets me get away with it and sometimes he makes me not pull the baby card. <laughs> if there's a bug, I pull the baby card. But you can be a spiritual baby, even though you're, you've been in, you've been a Christian for 50 years, you can be the baby. You can be a, a spiritual baby. And you can allow these things to knock you down every single time and never learn from them and never grow from them and always be complaining and always saying, oh, the devil's after me. The devil is this, the devil is that. Well, he's been defeated. I've got news, he's been defeated. If you think that the devil's after you, he's been defeated. Amen. Amen? Amen? He's defeated. You know, and I know he does things, but that's okay because God is working him in a corner for you. Just the way he worked it with the Israelites when their back was up against the Red Sea, he was working the devil into a corner. The devil got so prideful, he said, wow, look at that. They're going over the Red Sea. Let's follow them. And God said, I got you right where I want you. And what did he do when they got halfway? Oh, they couldn't get through because their wheels were clogged. And then the, God closed up the Red Sea. So sometimes these trials that you're going through, it's working. The devil is nothing more than a stooge. All right, I want to just take like one minute and talk about the devil. Okay, because I, I would rather talk about God, but I just want to, in case you were wondering, the devil is just nothing more than a stooge for God. Because what God uses him, God uses him the same way God used him with the children of Israel. They went through 
some hard times. They had to make bricks without straw. You know the story. All right, why is that? Because he was working up the confidence in the devil to say, I've got them. And then they were backed up against the Red Sea. God opens the Red Sea. The devil is so full of pride that you would have thought that he opened up the Red Sea to do it. They got over safely, and God says, now the Egyptian that has been harassing you, you're going to see no more. And that's what he's saying to you, is that sometimes these things seem so hard, and they're working them out, and you're trying to make bricks without straw, and you're saying, God, what is going on? And he's saying, you know what? I'm weaving something up here, and I'm putting things together. And what I'm doing is I'm making it so that the devil you see now, you're going to see no more because he's a stooge. He's not anything that you need to be concerned about because Christ has the victory. Amen? Amen. I'm trying to encourage you that if you're going through a hard time, God is on your side tonight. Yes. Yes. And faith trials is going to be an encouragement to you that if you can see the end, the end is you win. No matter what happens, you win. Yes. No matter what goes on, you win. Amen. Amen? Dire circumstances force us to look inside and evaluate ourselves. We look inside our faith. I mean, I was looking. And boy, when you start looking, God's faithful to show you. You know, that you're nothing but a baby, and you've got to grow up, and you can't act like this anymore. You know, you've got more responsibility now, even though I didn't feel like it. You know, you can't act like that. You can't do that. Trials force us to use our spiritual muscles to make them stronger. And as we grow spiritually, we're able to handle tests and troubles better. Tests and trials strengthen our relationship with God. See, it'll push you closer to God, or it'll push you further away, depending on whether you're acting in your emotions, and then you get mad at God, you don't want anything to do. You know, why, why, God, why are you doing this? You know, I'm so good, and I'm so this, and I'm so that, and you should do this. And, you know, just like that little boy with the cookie, and you're trying to bargain with God and get him to do stuff. And he's saying, hey, relax. I'm just weaving stuff. You'll see it in the end. I'm okay with this. You throw a tantrum, I'm good with that, too. We'll just discipline you. You know, you just prolong your trial. You're going to be miserable. It's still going to go this way, so you might as well have a good attitude. So that's what we learn as we mature. We learn to trust God even if we don't see any results right away. We know that God's working behind the scenes on our behalf. We learn that God is wise and we trust God to come through for us. And we learn to see a bigger picture, that it's more than just about us. Our life is more than just about our stuff. You know, just expect resistance from the devil. But don't magnify it. He's there, you know, it's like the bugs in Texas. They're there, <laughs> they're there. I'm all right with all of them except for those big roachy things. I don't mind the crickets. I had a cricket on me on Friday and I water rodents and one lady was very, very gentle and she goes, Ooh. she goes, I just didn't want to scare you that you had a cricket on you. I'm all right with the crickets, I don't, just the roaches, just those, big ugly nasty things but you know what they're here just deal with it it's like the devil he's here just deal with it he's defeated so what he does when there's roaches he goes and he gets the spray and he sprays everywhere <laughs> gets that stuff out and he gets rid of them and he kills them so instead of them walking around they're on their back like that so they're defeated too so god might be backing the devil in your life into a corner so that once he's put in his place you won't have to ever see him again so even if things are hard you can say i know he's working and i know he's working he's working to put that devil right in the corner and then the red sea is going to close up and you're going to be gone in first corinthians 16 9 it says for a great door and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries okay so we know that amen there's many adversaries so we just move on, we accept it, and we just go for it, we know. In Job 14, 1, it says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. All right, number two, trials are scripturally attested. We can expect trials because scripture tells us they're waiting for us. 
All right, so we know that. But you know what, I feel sorry for the people that don't know that, like the unsaved. There's trouble in their life too, but they don't have God the Father. Trials say it's time to move forward. It says in 1 Peter, Beloved, think of that strain concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And on his, their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The scripture is just full, full of encouragement when you're going through trials and troubles and, and hard things. <coughs> For 2 Timothy says, um, 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12, that thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of all, out of them all the Lord delivered me. Let that be our testimony. Out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay, so if you want to live godly, here's persecution. You're going to get it. We can see it in this country. If you can't see it, then you're living under a rock because it's coming to us. The things that our brothers and sisters are experiencing in China and in Iran and Egypt and all these other places where Christians are persecuted for their faith. It's coming here. You can see, you can see it. You can see it. Number three, trials are experientially verified. In Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The Lord delivers them out of them all. If you're going through something now, get that scripture and put it up on your refrigerator or on your mirror or whatever. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And that's our testimony. The Lord is delivering me out of this affliction. The Lord is delivering me. The trouble we even bring on ourselves can be used for our good if we, if we can see what we did wrong. I mean, let's face it, we all mess up, right? We do, we all mess up. But if we repent and change our actions, God can help us get out of that mess. So he doesn't just leave us alone, even when we do it ourselves. He's there to help us. Why? Because he's a good father. He's not a bad father. He's a good father, and he loves us. And remember, in persecution, we need to learn to thank God that he is going to get us through it and that there is a greater good. You've got to believe some of the things that people go through, you've got to believe that there's a greater good, that somebody somewhere else is going to get some good out of it. You know, I don't want to waste the things that I've been through. I've been through things, you've been through things. I don't want to waste it and just get through it for my own sake. I want to be able to minister to people and say, look, you know, there is an end to it. This is what God did for me. God will do it for you too. Maybe not the same way, but there is a God. He's real. He's real. Every area can be touched, physical, financial, emotional. Satan will always attack you in the soul or the sense realm, but he can't touch your spirit. Your spirit belongs to God. You can have security that you are not backslidden just because you're experiencing troubles. You don't think just because things are happening to you that God's mad at you. Sometimes these things just happen. And, you know, it happens for our good. But sometimes, you know, we examine and we say, Lord, why is this happening? Sometimes it's just bad teaching. You know, the curse cause list does not come. Yes, that's true. Because it says it in the Bible. But it also says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And sometimes these things happen. You know, genetics. Why do people get sick? I don't know. Genetics have a lot to do with it, even though we have a different bloodline. I mean, there's so many factors into why. I don't even like to say why some things, because I'm not God. I don't know why things happen, why bad things happen to good people and 
you know, I don't know why. I think that's where we just have to trust God that he's up there and he's weaving things and he's putting things together and we're going to have the victory in it no matter what. It says, these things in John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen? He's overcome the world. And he's using us. We have made our plan when we made Jesus our Lord and Savior that he can use our hands and our feet to go out and save and go out and be a witness to other people. You know, we have to choose between a normal natural reaction or a response that's influenced by God's word when we get trials and tribulations. We have, to, we have a choice. We have to choose. God's not going to make that choice for us. We have to choose how we're going to act. When troubles arise, do you automatically reach for the natural solution? Or do you begin to thank God for the answer as you seek his wisdom? You know, when something happens, what's the first thing you do? Now, oh God, I thank you that you're going to show me. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I don't know how, you know, what's going to be the end of this sickness. I don't know what's going to be the end of this, this domestic problem. I don't know what's going to be the end of this financial problem or this emotional problem. I don't know what the end is, Lord, but I'm, I'm looking to you for direction because you said the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. So I want you to just take me, Lord, and show me how to get through this because I don't know what to do. Joy is contagious. Joy and joy under fire brings a blessing to others. A grumbler places limitation on his usefulness to God. Grumblers are no fun to be around. If you've ever had a big project and you've got a grumbler, it's like, would you just please go somewhere else? <laughs> it's not helping. You know, we're, we've had things go when I was working you know, in the working world, not that I don't work now, because I kind of do, but <laughs> when we were working on projects and had a lot of people around and something would go wrong, you know, you know there's people that want to grumble right in the middle of a crisis. And it's like, you know what, afterwards, we can, let's have a meeting and talk about it. But right now, we really shouldn't be grumbling about this. We should just all work together so we can get through. Like if something seriously goes bad with a VBS day and, you know, your kids are running all over and, you know, they're, they're just going nuts. It's like, not, that's not the time to grumble about what we should have done. Let's just corral them all in, sit them all down, send them on their way, and then afterwards we'll talk about it. <laughs> you know, don't be the one that's in the middle of the stream complaining. You know, we're, we're in the middle of the stream. We can't go back. We can't go, you know, we got to go forward. But don't be the grumbler, the complainer. Yeah, things go wrong and things we didn't think about until you're like, oh yeah, well maybe we should have done that or we should have, well, let's have a meeting about it. We'll meet afterwards, but let's pull together now. And there's some people that just love to complain about everything. You know, don't be that person. Be the one that has enough grace to keep it zipped until we get to the side of the stream. And if you want to vent and have a little whatever, that's okay. You know, I understand you're going to blow off steam and then let's sit down and get a constructive thing. But don't be the one always complaining, well, why does this always happen? And why is well, sometimes, especially in church work, there's not enough workers. And so something falls through the crack. Sometimes, you know, I didn't go to school for any of this. I had the school of hard knocks is how I got behind a, a microphone. I didn't go to Bible school. So, you know, I don't know some things that maybe I should know or whatever. So anyways, but don't be a grumbler. I don't know, I guess that was kind of free, wasn't it? <laughs> Elijah was spiritually exhausted and he sat under a tree and begged God to die. Before that, he had courageously confronted Jezebel's prophets. God took care of him out of his mercy. And he recognized Elijah's state of mind was due to spiritual exhaustion. When you get spiritually exhausted, you know, you can't do everything all in one day. You gotta take a rest. You gotta sit back, you gotta do something. So don't think you gotta do everything in one day. Pace yourself. Paul and Silas imprisoned in Philippi. 
Although it looked like a negative situation for Paul and Silas, an entire town was saved because they were in that jail. Think of that. The entire town was saved because they went to jail. You know, does that blow your mind? It blows my mind every time I read that story. It's like God, they wouldn't have gotten saved. That jailer wouldn't have gotten saved. You know, I guess some people just need the fireworks of a huge earthquake and, you know, and, but God will do that. If that's what it takes to get that guy saved, God would make an earthquake and do all that and put somebody in prison who would be smart enough not to complain but to sing praises to God. I mean, the whole story is just, to me, it's an incredibly mind-blowing story that if he hadn't been put in prison, that whole church wouldn't have been started. You know, just think about it the next time you read that story. You know, if he had prayed and, and said, God, you know, you know I don't deserve this, and he was down in prison, and I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like the prisons now. I mean, they, they were sitting on a dirt floor, they were naked, they had already been beaten, and, and he was just sitting there not feeling sorry for himself. He was singing praises to God. And the whole prison system, they, they all got saved. So he was there, it wasn't a good thing for him, but God got so much glory out of it. And if you study Paul's life, you'll see that most of his Christian life was spent in trouble, and yet his life glorified God. Today, many Christians are caught up about the blessings of God and how to live a happy life. You know, the trials you go through are gonna help somebody. And that's what you need to tell yourself is, this is gonna help somebody else. You already got your salvation. You know, it says that God looks at the unseen. While we're looking at the scene, we're, we're fighting that daily battle. God's up here and he's putting these things together in the unseen. And he's using our lives to put these things together because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He doesn't want one person to perish. And sometimes your life has to be held up as a living sacrifice. And sometimes it's not comfortable, and sometimes it hurts. But is it all worth it if one soul gets saved because of what you've been through? Amen? I mean, you think about it. You know, joy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It's an incorruptible attribute that comes from our spirit and not from our soul or our senses. You can't touch my joy. You can't steal my joy. I can let you have it. I have that free will, but you can't steal it from me. Joy is what is seen in our lives and it draws other people to us because we have joy. I don't mean you go around like, you know, if, if you're going through hard stuff and you're acting, you know, like, yeah, yeah, thank God, it's, you know, right? No, no, you've got a, there's a quietness about you and there's just a joy about you. There's a peace, there's a settled one. All right, trials perfect endurance. Knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. Trials prove us in every area. It says in Job 23.10, but I know that the way that I take, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Okay. Um, it says in Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 5, I'm just going to highlight it. He was talking about, and you shall remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou should keep his commandments or not. So he led them in the desert. There was a purpose for that, even though at the time it probably didn't seem like that. Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. And I am come that they have life, and that I might have it more abundantly. Faith trials aren't the only way to be taught spiritual principles, but they are the only way to have your faith proven. You can't prove your faith any other way but trials. You won't mature if you're not tested. You may think you know something, but the test proves whether you really know it or not. And then further down the road, be assured there's going to be a retest. And further down the road, there'll be even a more retest. 
Um, you can write these scriptures down. I don't want to hold you too much longer. Malachi 3, 2 and 3. 1 Peter 1, 1, 7. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Get these scriptures in your spirit so that you can combat these things, so that you can have victory, so that when you're in the middle of the stream and you can't go back and all you can do is press forward, you have the faith in God to know that he's going to get you to the other side and you'll be okay. Trials secure our confidence and trust in the Lord solely. Psalm 118, 6 and 8. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. The three Hebrew children were thrown in the furnace because they wouldn't bow their knee. But they came out and they didn't even smell like smoke. Trials and tests prove our relationship to God as a son or daughter. We profit by being a partaker of his holiness. This causes us to yield the fruit of righteousness in our lives. So we don't want to, we don't want to be afraid of the trials or, or be upset with God. Just know that he's working up there. He's putting things together and he's pulling people from here. He's pulling people from there and he's putting a plan together so that not only is it going to benefit us, it's going to benefit somebody else and pull somebody else into the kingdom. So count it all joy when you're being tested because somebody is watching you and somebody can, it can be the very thing that will take them into the doors of salvation. So here's some promises if you're being tried and you can look up the scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You won't be tried beyond your limitation. Now, if you get out on thin ice because you've done something, I mean, some people have trouble after trouble because of their own making. All right, this is trials that God is God is certified for you. Now, if you've got out and you've done things and you're disobedient, it's not that scripture is not going to work for you. I guess is what I'm trying to tell you. But it will work for you if you repent. And then God's going to help you to get that ball of wax and get it under control. Okay, the next one. Psalm 34, 19. Deliverance out of a trial will come if we exercise patience and obedience to God's way. Isaiah 43, 2 and Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. God's presence will always be with you. You can always count on the presence of God to be there. Psalm 30, verse 5. If you can learn to rejoice, joy will keep you through your trials. And I want to leave you with this. In Luke 16, 19 through 31, Jesus told about the fate of the rich man who died and went to hell. He didn't suffer any adverse consequences while he was alive, did he? No, he had everything he needed. Lazarus the beggar also died. He didn't receive any outpouring of finances to re relieve his distress during his natural lifetime. He had sores, he was sick, he was hungry. But when he died, he was received into Abraham's bosom and gained his reward. Lazarus couldn't help the rich man even if he wanted to because there was a gulf that was between them. But from this parable, we can conclude two things. First thing, sometimes things in this life will never be fair, okay? Some things will never be fair. It's the way it is. We may not get recompense in this life for our suffering. Just like Lazarus didn't get recompense in this life. And it wasn't fair. What happened to him wasn't fair. But it's what happened to him. And number two is God knows everything and there will be justice for everything. But it will be in God's time and not our time. And it may not be in this lifetime. So things aren't fair. But God's going to even out the scales. And if things are so bad in your life, or things are really unfair, just know that God is taking note of it. And it may not be right on this side of heaven. But when it gets to heaven, it's going to be right. Lazarus, Lazarus is with Jesus now. And that lifetime that he had of pain and sorrow is over with now. See, our life is just a blink. 
You know, the book of James says to study the prophets for examples of suffering and patience and how to stand up to afflictions in a God-honoring way. Study the lives of people, of those in the Bible, and see how they succeeded. How did they get through? How did they endure? So, and don't forget the children of Israel. They griped and grumbled and everything else, and God just couldn't do enough for them. You know, let's not be people that God just can't do enough to make us happy. Amen? Let's be a grateful, thankful people. This life is about fellowship with God and saving sinners from eternal death. To the degree that we submit to God is to the degree that God will use us. And I want to leave you with this scripture, James 5, 19 through 20. Brethren, if any do err, any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Our life is not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God and honor God with your bodies. Amen. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we are thanking you that, Father, if we're going through things and we're in the middle of a trial, Lord, that you are sending refreshment tonight. And Lord, you're giving us a way to get through this. Father, we are thanking you for the tools that you've given us. You thank, I thank you, Father, that you're bringing everything back to our remembrance when we're in the midst of the battle. Father, that, that the scriptures that were read tonight are something that, that you've revealed to us. Lord, when we're in the middle of it, in the heat of the battle, that you would, Father God, bring it back to our remembrance. Father, that we would see that picture of you weaving things in our lives. Father, bringing people together. Father, as only you can do that. Father, you've got billions of people on this planet that you're orchestrating lives and, and um, choreographing and doing things to, to get the, the lost saved. And Father God, we are thankful as we submit our life to be a living sacrifice that we do indeed count these things as all joy. And Father God, we are careful, Father, to give you the praise. We honor you. We glorify you, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. <clears throat> Well, you know what? We go through things. How many's ever went through a trial? How many wants to go through a trial? <laughs> Nobody's signing up tonight, huh? Well, you know what? Trials have a way to find you. Just call me, could you come and help me help me on something? You know, Jesus made a statement. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord with you always, even to the end of the world. We have a promise tonight from the Lord that he's with us regardless. And he will never, ever, ever, ever leave us alone. Amen. There's an old song that was just going off my heart. And uh, no, never.
want you just to, when we leave here, expect trouble. <laughs> it, now that's a strange word from a preacher, isn't it? <laughs> but many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you, but I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. So Jesus is with us. Let's sing that one more time. Listen, if you're going through something right now, just let God's presence minister to you. Because listen, he's, He is with you right now. He's never left you. He'll never forsake you. He's not going to leave you in a lurch. He's going to be right there and see that you go through this thing. Praise God. Because what happens, just as Pam was teaching, when you go through it, guess what? All that old dross and all that garbage is burned off. Praise God. Oh, no.
But I want to encourage you, just give them a call. I know they still got some beds that need to be set up and things that need to be done. And if, you, if you're available and you want to help them, listen, God will reward you for it. Pat and I went over there the other day and we just kind of took charge of moving for them. Dora said, you're the, you drive trucks, you, you, you move before, you drive this truck for me now. No, she asked me to do it. She didn't tell me. <laughs> Praise God. So I drove the truck, and then we helped load, we helped unload. Praise God. They're getting there. Amen. Amen. Nobody's ever moved. How many know how hard that is sometimes? I right, just need to pray a prayer for Brother Kruger and Doris. Say, Lord, strengthen them. Give them wisdom. And if you can help, if you, if you just want to see what you can do for them, I'm sure that they'll accept it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand our feet tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isn't God good? Did y'all enjoy that tonight? Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. I tell you what, this woman here, she's a studier, and she is very thorough in what she studies. And I'm telling you, we've got those little study guides available too. If you want some of those, just to study the Book of James, we've got those some available. We can get them for you anyway through the printer. But uh, you know, it, it's a blessing. Amen. I like to get some of our books in all of your hands, and uh, we're, we're praying about doing that. We, we need to order some, and uh, we got one transformed by the desert experience. This goes on the trials, <laughs> and uh, transformed by the desert experience, redefining your call, refining your character. Then we got one called the Oasis of Life. After you come through the desert, guess what? God wants to bring you into a place of blessing. Amen. A place of blessing. So anyway, we we've got some things. We we both have authored five books, six books with that one. Is that right? Yeah. Six books with that one. <laughs> Amen. But God's good. Praise the Lord. And we got some CD series if you're interested in even seeing what we've got. Amen. Amen. My wife was overwhelmed when I showed her I had 360 something cassettes that needed to be put on uh, programs so we could put them on CDs. <laughs> Hallelujah. But she survived. Praise God. Well, Lord, we thank you. Just lift your hands and thank God. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings. Thank you, Lord, that we have what you say we have and we can do what you say we can do. And we just give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, God of the whole of my life, won't let me go. God bless you. We'll see you all Wednesday. He got into my heart. He got into my soul.